Before you get into this powerful content and this conversation, I need you all to do me a favor. Hit that subscribe button on the channel because that's the best way you're going to stay up to date with everything that's going on. Like, share, comment, review, and let me know what's going on, people. So, we are back once again, ladies and gentlemen. It's the Mitchell Report Unleashed podcast. I'm joined by Miss Christina. Christina, how's it going? I'm great. How are you? Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good afternoon for me. You know what I mean? And things like that for the time Very change. Good. Yeah, for the time change and all that good stuff. Um, let's get right into it. You know, I feel like we all have a story. We all have something to talk about. We all have something we've overcame and things like that. 2018, your life changed. You want to yes. do a little bit of a deep dive of why it changed for you? Absolutely. In March of 2018, my husband, Ken Flack, who was the number one doubles player in the world with his partner, Rob Seduso, they had won Wimbledon's, they were on the Davis Cup team, won a gold medal in Seoul, uh, got sepsis, and passed away within four days. And so my life turned pretty much upside down after that. I did, you know, Everything was perfect, and then everything wasn't, so yes. That is what has happened since 2018. I've had to figure out my life uh, as a widow uh, at a young age. I wasn't expecting to be widowed at my age um, and an empty nester and CEO of my company and doing my makeup. And then I was contacted by the Sepsis Alliance if I would be willing to bring awareness to sepsis because most people don't know what it is. And so I said, yes, I wanted to do that to honor my husband, but to also, I didn't want anyone else to go through what my family has gone through with the loss of Ken. What is sepsis? What is sepsis? Sepsis is an infection of the blood that attacks your organs. And so if you have an infection in your body, such as a cut or in my husband's case, bronchitis, which turned to pneumonia, and it's not treated, it shuts down all of your organs so quickly. If your listeners go to sepsis.org and scroll down, there's a little graphic that says time. And what that is, is T is for temperature. You can be incredibly hot or incredibly cold. I is for infection in some place in your body. M is for mental decline. And E is for excruciating pain. You are in incredible pain. You feel like you're dying because you are dying. And it's a very quick disease. If you go to, if you have any of these signs, it's a little confusing because if you're hot or you're cold, you don't know which you are. If you get to a hospital, go to an emergency, ask for a, you know, a blood test. Within 20 minutes, they will know if you're septic or not and can get you on an IV protocol and, and you can be saved. It's very treatable if you are treated within a, the right time frame. But if you're not, you're going to have the loss that, that my family has had. Yo, before we get into powerful conversations on this page, I need you all to do me a favor. Head over to Instagram, free platform. I'm posting tons of free content each and every moment I can. Instagram reels, Instagram posts, Instagram stories. Let's go. Continue the conversation. No, no, totally. So as, as, we, as the audience are listening to this, and I kind of want to speak on behalf of the audience, health is wealth, right? So Absolutely. when we go to the doctor, right, what is some of the things we should be checking for as from your being an advocate, you know, what are some of the things you feel like we should be checking for in our normal checkups or even asking our doctors and things like that? I think that you really need to listen to your body. You know your body better than anyone. And if you feel that something is amiss, say something. I know that my husband and I just took what the doctor said he was given cough medicine with codeine and no antibiotic, even though he said repeatedly that he had stuff coming out and he had glass in his chest and all these things, um, and uh, an inhaler. So if you are septic or have an infection and you take cough medicine with codeine, we think, oh, it's going to be so great. I'll take cough medicine with codeine and wake up in the morning and feel fantastic. Well, it's actually the opposite. Within 12 hours, because my husband didn't have the cough medicine, uh, didn't have an antibiotic with the cough medicine with codeine, his breathing slowed down so much that the infection grew like a wildfire. So I think the most important thing to do is listen to your body. And if you have any doubts or something doesn't sound right, 
get another opinion or ask another question. And that's really important to really, you know when your body has a, a cold or a flu. You know that feeling. But sepsis is something that's totally different. You're, you're, you're in a different, it's, you're in so much pain and you feel terrible. And so it's very different. So I think if people are just a, more aware of their bodies, you'll, I think you'll have a better outcome. <laughs> No, no, absolutely. I feel like, you know, my question to you is, you know, as a podcaster and having you come on this platform is how have you been, you know, since, since 2018 and, and what have, what has life been like? You know what I mean? Having a loss of a, of a loved one that's that close to you, you know, what have, what have you had to go through? What are some of the biggest things that you feel like you struggled with? And I want you to kind of connect with the audience of, with loss. You know, and some people don't know how to deal with loss because you think of the pandemic, you think of COVID, you think of this, right? And some people are looking to me, they're looking to you to really have these, you know, conversations or listen to these podcasts to be like, like, how do I overcome certain things, you know? Well, I think we're not educated in our society on how to deal with loss. People always say, well, if I lost someone, well, I can promise you, you are going to lose someone during your lifetime. It's not an if, it's a when. First of all, second of all, I have had a lot of loss. My mother had cancer when I was growing up and she died when I was 19. So I dealt with that. All four of my grandparents passed away. My son, Bo passed away on Christmas day when he was four and a half months old. And then my husband passed away. So I have dealt with, and then my business partner passed away a year after my husband. So I have dealt with a lot of loss. I, after my son passed away, I was a mess. Uh, my younger, so Bo was a, is, was a twin with my son, Ben. And so I had five children and I was taking these sleeping pills for about a month just to function because I didn't want to feel anything because it was so excruciating. I was so ill prepared to deal with the loss of my son. And so after about a month, my friends came in and said, enough's enough, get it together. You don't even, you're not a pill popper. You're, you know, you, this is ridiculous. So I have children. I had a husband at the time. I had to get it together. And so I did. So I think when Ken passed, I was more prepared than I was with Bo. Uh, I had, after Bo passed away, I'm going to back up a tiny bit. After Bo passed away, I started an educational fund at the Northern Light School in Oakland, California, which is a, Predominant, it's a private school for predominantly underprivileged children that are all there on scholarship. And so I didn't want Bo to be forgotten. So we started the Baby Bo Fund. And Vita Blue puts on, uh, he was a professional baseball player a long time ago, played for the A's uh, Giants. And he puts on a celebrity golf tournament every year. And Ken played in it. My kids have all participated at the school or in the golf tournament. And uh, Ken did as well. My son, Ben, for the past five years has play, been playing in this golf tournament, raising money for his brother's foundation. And then after Ken passed, Ken's foundation that I started there as well. Uh, ben has raised over $100,000 for those educational funds. And in past October, he raised $36,000, which may not sound like a ton of money, but it enabled three children to go to private school for an entire year. So that makes change in lives and communities and trickling down to the world. Um, I think it's important for kids. My kids have, my daughter Rose had said to me once, your lectures on drugs and alcohol or whatever were ridiculous. They were just dumb. But the way you conduct yourself, you're kind, you're hardworking, you're positive. You're, and then I, she said that is more impactful. So I think for me, my kids have seen that I have dealt with these tragedies in my life with as much dignity and grace as I've been able to do. And it isn't easy all the time. It's very hard. I miss my son. I desperately miss my husband. But I also know that making a difference in the world is important. But also for my children, if I'm a mess, it's going to affect them. So I, after Ken passed, I knew that I just couldn't go down that road of taking a pill or drinking too much wine to just numb myself. I actually became more disciplined than I normally am, which is pretty disciplined. I mm -hmm. 
woke up every morning and had my vitamins and green juice and vinegar and water and I yo went to yoga or I rode my horse or I hiked or went to pl I did something twice a day. I did some physical activity twice a day. So I think that when you're going through the beginning stages of grief, it is so important that you are kind to yourself because you're so fragile and everything seems even in magnitude worse when you're too hungry or too tired or overwhelmed. And so I realized when things got too much, I needed to take a walk or take a nap or eat or drink some water. So I, I think those are to, to start the grieving process. That's important. The exercise was incredibly important to just kind of keep my head on straight. Um, and I thought one day I was on a hike and I, I could hear my husband telling me how painful it was for him to look down on me crying in bed at night and he couldn't comfort me the way he normally would. And so I thought about like how I would feel if I had to watch him or my children, you know, crying about me. And I thought, it, it's not like I'm over his passing or Bo's passing. I've learned to manage it. I've learned to be grateful for the time that I had with them and try to honor them as best I can with the foundations. I started a garden with my friend Lisa Zimmer at the Edna McGuire School in Mill Valley. That is an outdoor classroom and garden for kids to, from kindergarten through fifth grade, to grow vegetables, plant seeds, harvest them, cook with them, do science experiments. There's chickens, there's fruit trees, and they can eat those during recess and snack. And so I feel that education and nutrition are incredibly important, and it needs to be taught at a young age. It can't be taught when you're 30. If you're in kindergarten and start eating a carrot or a tomato off the vine, you're going to do that throughout your life. And so I thought, for me, my way of dealing with this grief is to, to do – something for other people that that gives me joy and pleasure and I also don't think that grieving has to be this negative terrible widow with a black shawl on her head miserable because it's not doing any good for the rest of your family or the world I, I of course am sad a lot and I miss them but giving back or doing something good for others does bring me a lot of joy I love it. I love that you say that, you know, the power of being resilient, you know, and even on this podcast and doing some deep dive discovery on you. And I'm like, she's a very layered person. I just know that anytime I get into these conversations about overcoming adversity, I just know the power that's going to be behind it and how the audience is going to be to resonate with it. When we think of, did you ever go on the tennis court with, 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 uh, with Ken? I did. Mm -hmm. He liked to pretty hard to play golf, actually. Oh, yeah. <laughs> After he retired, all he wanted to do was golf. That was it. That was his passion. That mm -hmm. was his big love was golf. He could be on that golf course all day. And my mm -hmm. kids are all golfers, so he loved going to tournaments with them and caddying for them and playing with them. So, so do you play any golf yourself, though? I do. There you I go. Play golf. Not okay. so much anymore. I don't really have time, but I do enjoy it, and it's fun. It, golf is one of those things that – takes it's almost like a little mini vacation it takes you away and that's another thing during grieving if being outside breathing fresh air doing something like that it's really helps just take you out of your life it's kind of like you know when you go to a movie yes it seems different when you come back out of it you've been removed from it the situation a little bit and i think that's what golf is it distracts you in a of course way. no so true my dad is a big golfer you know what i mean oh, and yeah and I, part of me is like i need to go out there and have him teach me you know what i mean maybe i can maybe i can beat the master eventually but i don't, I don't know we'll see you know what i mean yeah. and all that good stuff yeah with us pivoting now i don't really like to say pivot but what's changing direction Okay. We think about your business. We think about pretty girl makeup. Now, when did that start for you? Because that's like your bread and your butter. That's like your baby. You built that. So speak yes. to the audience. Like, how did you build that? And how did you make that become the success that it is today? I started it in 1999, which is a very long time ago. And I was a makeup artist, and I still am. I have three agents in, across the country that book me jobs. And I was a mom that was constantly in a battle with a water bottle. And it was 
lip gloss, water. It was just this constant fight and I couldn't get a lip gloss to just stay on. So I thought, oh, I'm gonna invent my own. I just thought one day I'm gonna invent my own. And I was on holiday in Hawaii with my children and some friends and one of my girlfriends said, honey, our kids were at that age where they were finally in the pool by themselves. You didn't need to be in there watching over them. And they said, my friend said, oh my God, we're pretty girls. No one knows we're mommies for five minutes. And it made me laugh so hard. And I thought, every mom needs that, I think. Just five little seconds. And I thought, that's what I'm gonna call my company, Pretty Girl. Everyone wants to be a pretty girl. And I wanted, I named, I was inspired by the women the Jean and Jane that started uh, Benefit Cosmetics, that they had a funny little whimsical name on all their products, like Aruba and Atuba and just funny things. So I named all my lip glosses and lipsticks, Private Jet, Day at the Spa, Girlfriends, Rich Husband, uh, Love of My Life, Soulmates. And so I just wanted a mom that's in carpool lane and trying to work and do all these things. If they could look at a lip gloss for a one second and just kind of smile for a minute and put on their lip gloss. I just thought that would be a really great thing. So that's how it started. So what's one of the the biggest highlights of just being the celebrity makeup artist, right? Who is that one person that you met? I always like you get to meet some cool celebrities. So everybody has a different reaction. But who is that one cel that's the one celebrity that has really captivated you and what did you learn from them condoleezza rice Ooh, okay yeah i did a town magazine with her and but all my celebrities are isaiah washington journey metallica tyler florence bobby flay uh, dana perino i uh hillary swank i have been blessed with some really great uh, that's the fun part of my job. Besides getting to be artistic and making people look like the best versions of themselves, getting this time with them by myself for an hour or sometimes an entire day is, I can't even tell you what a gift that is. It is the best. And then I get paid, which sometimes I'm like, I can't even believe my day. I hung out with Condoleezza Rice. She's a big golfer. Our kid, my kid's coach uh, is her golf coach. So we, talked about golf and so it's always interesting the things that you end up talking about with people when they get in your chair you just never know and sometimes they don't want to talk at all so it has to be like quiet don't talk I know right <laughs> we I've I've gotten some some autographs from you know pro wrestlers and things like that and you kind of call them as celebrities too and things like that and you meet some close celebrities musicians I was like maybe oh my goodness I'm trying to think here I'm looking at my table about 10 feet uh, away from um, Kanye West at one of his concerts in Toronto. Oh, wow. And I have the video. I haven't posted the video, but it was like arm's length. But he had a security. Wow. Like, what am I going to go? Hi, Kanye. Like, I can't do that. <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. Next thing you know, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's game over and stuff like that. You speak about that one particular name, Bobby Flay. And I feel like I get sucked into watching his show, right? Oh, yeah. Can we beat right. Bobby Flay, right? So how was that interaction? With, with, with Bobby so Flay and stuff like that. I have been warned by people that he might be a little challenging. And so my agents will always say, you know, I'm the mother of five. I had five stepchildren. Like, I can deal with people. And so, excuse me, I had a shift in the chair. Uh, I, I was looking forward to meeting him. And so I went in there, I, not expect, I didn't know what to expect. I thought, well, if he's difficult, whatever, I don't care. He couldn't have been nicer. He made me a cup of tea. He actually was a big tennis fan and knew who my husband was. And he, when I, after he brought me the tea, he said, your last name's Flack. And I said, yes, it is. And he said, are you married to Ken Flack? And I said, yeah, I am. And he goes, how the fuck did you get that guy to marry you? <laughs> and I'm like, sorry. What no, it's fine. <laughs> I wonder how I, you know, he got me to marry him is what I think. So anyway, my husband, when I went home that day, my husband was cracking up. He just said, I, he thought that was the funniest story ever. He told everybody about that, like what, what Bobby had said. And so he was great. I really, I, I think I'm very, I'm the, uh, the grumpy whisperer. People are grumpy or difficult. I can soften them. So he, he was fantastic. Isaiah Washington. He's another handful. I love him. He's, we did a TV show together last year. Uh, 
for Fox called Kitchen Talk. So I was with Isaiah for two weeks every day and I adore him. So I, I have a really good time. I think attitude, I have a pretty positive attitude and I enjoy people and I am blessed that things tend to work out well. What makes you different than all of the other makeup artists that we're starting to see in this content creation world? And what is one thing that you do differently that sets yourself apart? Well, I definitely know that I go the extra mile for my clients. I always make sure that they have water, that they have food. I'm very in tune to if they want quiet or if they want me to listen or if they want to talk. So I, I do that. I get aromatherapy oils out. I hydrate them. I Nothing is beneath what I need to do to make things good. I will always, if the photographer needs help or the stylist, I will go the extra mile. I don't think, oh, I'm a celebrity makeup artist. I don't do that. That doesn't happen. I just try my hardest just like I did when I was starting. And so I think I don't say no. I have a positive attitude on set. I don't say, when are we done? I'm leaving or I'm not doing that. And I don't just sit there on my phone in between. I'm very present on the set. I'm watching to make sure there's not a hair out of place, that there's not shine. I, I work really, really hard. And I think... People tend to want to work with me because of the experience I've had making sure like in post production that they don't have to do a ton of work on the images because I've made sure that they're not shiny, that there's not bags under their eyes. I've made them look as best they can look. And so I think people, and I'm, I, I, I have a good attitude. I just think the whole thing, I think that's what sets me apart. I love that. I know it's like when I came from the health and fitness world, you see so many trainers like during classes or one-on-one -on -one training and they're on their phone. So I love how you speak to that. They're on their phone. Like the only time you should be on your phone is if you have to reference to something and like you're showing the other person. And I seen that in health and fitness and I was like, you know what? And then this 2020 happened and COVID happened. I was kind of happy that I kind of got out of the, the gym industry because there's just so much things that you see. And now for me, podcasting for the last five years and life coach and things like that, it's so it's so rewarding now that you can have these intimate conversations with people. Right. Remotely, face-to-face, -face, clients that I've worked with in the past and things like that. So we're 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 so needed in this world. You know what I mean? Like if you're gonna connect with somebody on the phone, get them on FaceTime if that's gonna be the conversation. I, I think that's the best way to have a conversation. It's like even with these podcasts, sometimes they just want it to be audio and I don't feel the connection. Then you and I can sit and talk for hours because because we're looking at each other. But if it was on the phone, it just it doesn't flow the same. And I think it's so interesting. I used to think, oh, gosh, why is this happening to me? But sometimes now that I think this is happening for me. And so I think if you can look at these different things, COVID happened, it's clearly a pain no one likes it but what can you get for, what can you do to make this a positive experience D during the beginnings of covid i had all this makeup that i had and i would put little gift things together and drop it at someone's house to have a little spa experience it kept me busy but it also brought someone some joy i hope and uh i think happiness is a choice and no one wants to be around anyone with a bad attitude or that's negative or lazy. And I think it, we can, I redid my, my business partner and I, Jordan Hall, we redid the website during COVID. We put up a business plan. We got investors. You can use your time wisely. It's a, you know, being productive, being happy is a choice. So I think you need to be a bit disciplined during this COVID. It wasn't the time to be ordering dominoes and just sitting around watching Netflix. You could still go out and exercise. You could still eat well. This was the time to look at your life, evaluate it and think, okay, what can I do differently? What can I change? So that was people during this time either made changes or became incredibly stagnant and lazy. I love that you say that. I just was on a conversation the other night about this exact same thing. And it's like 2020 will show us who's working harder behind the scenes. And, you know, for me, it's like, I'm in, I'm in, I'm in Canada, Ontario, the province, 
located near Toronto. And we're in a stage two indoor dining is closed. Gyms are closed. And I know some people that are in the gym. They work in the gym or they work out in the gym. And a lot of people are feeling it. And a lot of people ask me like, well, Rory, how do you bounce back? How do you do this? I said, listen, I lock myself into my craft. Yes, I have my nine to five job. But when I'm braked and I'm not doing anything and I'm just chilling, I'm not really chilling. I'm creating. Like I'm creating content. I'm always finding a way to stay ahead of the game. And if people just stay ahead and just, I say 1% better each and every day, there's so much you can accomplish. So much you can accomplish. Nothing is impossible, I don't think. And I think people get so consumed in their own life. What are you doing to make the world a better place? What are you doing to help others? Uh, I think here's the other thing. People complain about their work. I hate my job. I hate my job. Then get a different job. Speak about that. Then move. You're not in cement. It's nothing is going to, no one is going to change your life, but you. So So it's important to figure out what brings you joy and then figure out how to get paid and where you want to live. It's, and then if that doesn't work out, it's okay. It's taking you to another step, make another, make another choice, make another change. And I think that you're an athlete, you know, self-care is so incredibly important and we're not, it's so funny how we're told you're being selfish. If you take time to exercise or get your nails done or get a massage or go for a hike. I work with an energy healer and she's Canadian and my mother was Canadian. So I have a big connection. My, one of my investors is Canadian. Um, Diane tells me you can't give an orange unless you have a basket of oranges to give. So it's super, right? Think about it. Love that. Right. So this morning I woke up, did the green juice, the vitamins, the whole thing. Went in the car, got in the car and went to my yoga class, the hot power yoga for 45 minutes and then got home to get ready for our chat. And I definitely know my energy is at another level because I started my day with water and exercise and affirmations and meditation and prayer. So I think that's how I try to make my life positive. I love it. I love that you said the oranges with a basket of origins, origins, sorry. Like, yeah. So before we get out of here, I always ask this question to all my guests. What is that one thing you're looking to do for 2022? Like we're in January, it's a couple days in, you know, Okay. what is that one? Yeah. What are you looking to do to complete? When do you know you're complete 2022? Well, I don't think I'm ever complete. I think Mm -hmm. we're constantly evolving and making change, but I think uh, just trying to stay positive to work on my company, work on myself uh, and be the best version of me every day. That's what I'm trying to do. I love it. Where can everybody check you out, Christina? Where can everybody check out your website, check out your Instagram, see all the work you're doing and even get in touch with you. Okay. Uh, My Instagram is Christina flack makeup. And Pretty Girl Makeup is P-R-E-T-T-Y-G-I-R-L-M-K-U-P. Uh, prettygirlmakeup.com, christinaflack.com. You can contact me there. And what else? Twitter, Facebook, we're on LinkedIn. We're all over the place. So, and uh, there's a 25% discount code with uh, the discount. The code is Pretty Girl for your listeners. Oh, wow. Okay. That's an exclusive. I like that. Yeah. I have to put that in the show notes, everybody. So all the ladies, men, for your ladies, you know yeah. what I mean? Valentine's Day is coming up. Definitely. For sure. For sure. Well, Christina, it's been a pleasure. Thank and thank you. Thank you for me. I'll look forward to chatting with you again. We'll talk soon, for sure. I will, yeah. I'm all about collaboration. You know what I mean? I agree. No, definitely.